Good morning. My name is Ariel Rock. I'm a co-chair of the 2008 Energy Symposium. I would like to thank you all for attending uh, today and to welcome you to the 2008 Berkeley Energy Symposium, Leadership at the Nexus of Science, Policy, and Business, presented by the Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors and partners whose assistance and support made this event possible. I would also like to thank all the Energy Symposium staff and volunteers who have put in countless hours in order to make this event a success. We have an exceptional lineup of speakers today, as well as an expanded scope from the initial symposium last year. I invite you all to reach out to the various UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab people that are presenting or attending in order to strengthen the ties between the university, policymakers, and business people. I'd like to start off by inviting the co-chair of the Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative to start off the day. Naveen Sika is a full-time MBA student at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. Naveen is concentrating his studies on finance and energy, and in addition to being a full-time student, is a Haas nonprofit board fellow with the Hanna Boys Center, an educational institution for at-risk boys located in Sonoma. Please welcome Naveen Sika. Good morning. When I thought about what to say with my opening remarks in front of this group of very uh, prestigious individuals, I immediately gravitated to this year's symposium theme, leadership at the nexus of science, policy, and business. During today's keynote speeches and panel sessions, you'll hear a great deal about science, policy, and business from some of the world's best and brightest minds. But what may not be discussed as much is the first part of our symposium theme, leadership. Now, as a student at the Haas School of Business, if there's one topic that constantly arises in our MBA classes, it's the topic of leadership. And if I could distill all of that classroom conversation on leadership, it pretty much boils down to about three things that we've been taught at Haas about leadership, all of which are very relevant to today's symposium. First, we've been taught that leadership isn't just about standing up here and talking, but it's about setting a vision and taking action to achieve that vision. This campus very much has a vision and is certainly taking exciting, exciting actions to achieve it. The members of the UC Berkeley community, the people in this room, will build the world's sustainable energy future. You can see this through the many current camp campus initiatives happening. We have the Energy Biosciences Institute, EBI, the $500 million 10-year research collaboration between LBL, UC Berkeley, British Petroleum, and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We have the Berkeley Stanford Clean Tech Conference Series, started by Berk member Bhavik Joshi. The first conference this past fall was on the electrification of vehicles, and it was a smashing sellout success. The next conference is on May 7th and is about utility scale solar power generation. And at Berkeley, the best is yet to come. Last week, I met with Arun Majumdar, head of the Environmental Energy Technologies Division at LBL. Arun described how in the next year, LBL and UC Berkeley will jointly create a new initiative called Hyperbrick. Hyperbrick stands for High Performance Building Research and Implementation Center. It will focus on reducing, reducing energy consumption in existing buildings by 50% and in new buildings by 90%. It's a huge initiative. As Arun described it, it's EBI-like in its scale on the demand side of the equation. Arun's here in the audience today. As you see him, please feel free to discuss this with him. The second lesson that we've been taught at Haas about leadership is that leadership's not about one person or a few people but it's about working together successfully as a team, as a union of concerned individuals who want to improve things, who want to make a difference in the world. In regard to this campus and this symposium, that union of concerned individuals is BERC, the Berkeley Energy and Resources Collaborative. Founded only three years ago by a handful of students, we are now over 400 members strong, and our members are the glue 
in this campus's environmental and energy scene. Everything you see here today, the logistics, the selection of panels, and the organization of this conference was put together by Burke members who want to make a difference. The last thing that we've learned at Haas about leadership, and perhaps most importantly, is that leadership is about passion. Yesterday, Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson spoke at Haas. He used the word caring. He said that leadership is about caring. Last fall, a distinguished Haas faculty member yelled in class that leadership is about love. Passion, caring, love. The concepts are all the same. Just by being here today, by caring about energy and the environment, we are all showing our love for the world, for our homelands, and for our families. In this sense, we are all leaders because we are passionate, we care, and we love. So instead of thanking you for coming today, I'd like to instead congratulate you, all of you, for being leaders. Please consider that with sincerity as you participate in today's event and even after you leave today. Thanks for listening to me. Please enjoy this year's UC Berkeley Energy Symposium on leadership at the nexus of science, policy, and business. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Naveen. Our next speaker will provide opening remarks about Berkeley's leadership position in energy research across a variety of disciplines. Paul Wright is acting director of the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society at UC Berkeley. Professor Wright also serves as the Associate Dean of the College of Engineering co-chair of the Management of Technology program, and co-director of the Berkeley Manufacturing Institute. He is the A. Martin Berlin Professor of Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Please welcome Professor Wright. Thank you very much. Ariel, thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be chosen to open this conference. I was here last year, and I must say it was a really exciting event, and I, I'm looking forward to the event. Uh, Citrus, as you just heard, is the Center for Information Technology Research uh, with the impact on society. That's what the IS is about, and it just reflects many of the opening speeches. The uh, Citrus activity is a four-campus activity. Berkeley, Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz are involved. Uh, many, many colleagues are involved so long that I couldn't pit, put them all on my first slide. Uh, actually, you know, there were four of these kinds of institutes begun by the previous governor, uh, Gray Davis. They were launched in 2001. Uh, $100 million was provided to each one of these four institutes shown here, Citrus, IT Squared, CNSI, and QB3. QB3 is also on the Berkeley campus. Each one of those institutes had to raise $200 million to get the $100 million match. And the goals, the, the whole uh, values of that, these institutes are to educate the next generation workforce and create the kind of new companies that we're here today to discuss. The next slide shows the kinds of industries that you can't read that have been founded by UC Berkeley faculty. Uh, I think the reason for showing this list is that it's long. And then more recently, with my colleagues in Citrus, a number of companies that are shown here have been created. Uh, the first one, Alien Technologies, is an RFID company. The next three, uh, Dust Networks, is very famous now, begun by our colleague uh, Chris Pista. Uh, David Culler began Arch Rock. Uh, some of the graduate students in Citrus began Motive. Uh, wireless Industrial Technologies is another wireless company that focuses on the aluminum industry. And then Sidebeam, involving my, my good friend Gary Baldwin, is to using 60 gigahertz uh, networks in home uh, development. So there are many opportunities today to discuss these kinds of startup companies. I want to tip my hat to the wonderful students in Haas. Uh, these were some of the three uh, companies that I think have been begun maybe since the last conference, actually, Adura, Aurora, and Banyan Energy. 
Uh, the one on the left there is to do with wireless technologies. And so I think we can look to the students at both uh, the engineering school and the business school for beginning these uh, important companies. Looking ahead, I have just two more slides before I hand over to the rest of the conference. I spend a lot of my time in the evenings, and I guess you do too, uh, reading the Stern Review, the famous report that came out from the British government two or three years ago that looked at the economics of uh, energy development in relationship to greenhouse gas emissions. Based on the Stern Review, the McKinsey work that was sponsored by many companies, including Vattenfall, the uh, European energy company, began to look at the trade-offs between greenhouse gas emissions, industry, and the uh, different kinds of technologies. And then one thing, of course, is clear that the California Title 24 program, the policy program there, is absolutely key to getting our new businesses launched. I mean, quite frankly, if you don't work with the Ca California Title 24 activities and don't relate them to your business, it's hard to know exactly how your business is going to grow. And a curve like this, which I took from the Stern Review, um, looks complicated at first, but what it does along the x-axis is plot how much abatement you can get from these different technologies. And of course, hydrogen vehicles would be one of the best ways of getting carbon abatement, but the amount of money that it would cost to do that is huge. So that's why it's very high on the y-axis. Over time, as our technologies begin to improve in hydrogen vehicles, moving from 2020 to 2040, the cost of getting the abatement should be less because it's a technology driver. Down here in the left-hand corner are some of the things that we especially focus on in Citrus, the energy efficiency and the demand response area using the smart dust uh, activity and now commercialized by dust networks. And then I was just thinking as I was driving in this morning, way back here, way out on the negative x-axis are rather mundane things like refrigerators, uh, low emissivity windows, the DOE2 architecture program. These were created you know, over the last decades and have had a huge an impact on abatement and they don't show on this curve. But they nevertheless were our, were our predecessors history in this California Title 24 activity. What's interesting about these things is that energy efficiency and, uh, and deforestation, these kind of things can have quite a dramatic impact on abatement, not as much as attacking hydrogen vehicles, but uh, they have a big impact and this is some of the low-hanging fruit to create companies that can uh, be productive and also avoid um, a GHD uh, uh, emissions. And so that's why it's nice, looking back, that companies like Adura here have really focused on wireless technologies to create um, more efficient lighting in, a fa in, in, in buildings and in uh, residences. Finally, as we all know, uh, the Chicago Carbon Exchange, the European uh, carbon policies, are beginning to create an environment where the uh, carbon price may well affect uh, some of the ways in which we can produce electricity more efficiently. Here's a very simple, it's a little sophomoric, but it's a slide that's worth showing in an opening presentation, where over time the red line shows how any of the new technologies that you're creating in this audience have a learning curve, and the uh, more you learn, again, the x-axis is time, the more uh, electricity you create at a lower cost. So that every, everybody in this room who's a techie like me is trying to come down this learning curve with whatever technology they're interested in. At some point, uh, your technology would cross the established technology, which is the lower green line, and your technology, solar power, whatever it is, will become efficient. But with carbon pricing uh, in, in future markets, especially in Europe, and if promoted by the uh, Chicago Carbon Exchange, where the price of carbon is about 2 to $5 a ton right now, uh, it would show, as that line comes up, that new technologies are going to cross this line more quickly and give a much more uh, effective interaction between the carbon pricing and the deployment. So I'm ending by saying, with these things, uh, the, the theme of the conference is an exciting one. It's bringing in things like California's Title 24, it's the business aspects that you guys are really excited about. It's the tech activity that I'm excited about with my colleagues in Citrus. And as my friend Alan Kay of Xerox Park once said of computing, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So today is about inventing the future in this really exciting area. And once again, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this chance to present this for five minutes. Ariel, I'll hand back to you. Thank you.
Senator Barbara Boxer has graciously agreed to provide us with taped opening remarks as well. Senator Boxer is one of the nation's leaders in the effort to protect our natural environment. As a majority chairperson of the Senate Committee on Environmental and Public Works, Senator Boxer said last week that she will lead a committee investigation into the EPA's denial of California's request for a waiver under the Clean Air Act. She has sponsored bills to reverse the EPA waiver decision to protect the California coast and the Arctic Na National Wildlife Refuge from oil drilling, to make polluters pay the cost of Superfund cleanup, and wrote the law to set drinking water standards at levels that protect children and other vulnerable populations. She has a long record of supporting the environment, both in California and in the rest of the United States. Bear with us one second. Good morning. This is Senator Barbara Boxer, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2008 UC Berkeley Energy Symposium. I only wish that I could be there in person. I am so proud of the leadership that California has taken in working toward a solution to the challenge of our generation, global warming. Chancellor Birchenow and the students at UC Berkeley have shown tremendous dedication to saving our planet with an ambitious goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the Berkeley campus to 1990 levels by 2014. At the national level, we are working to make the federal government a model of energy efficiency. When the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 became law in December, it included several bills passed by the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, which I chair. This new law provides for construction and retrofits to create a new generation of green government buildings, authorizes installation of a solar wall at the Department of Energy, how symbolic is that, and makes grants available to local governments to make their buildings energy efficient too. Time is not our friend when it comes to global warming. Time is of the essence. Right now, there is a tremendous momentum for action, and I'm working hard to harness that momentum to pass strong global warming legislation through the Congress this year. There is no doubt in my mind that the next administration will be far more receptive to such legislation, but we have to begin now to see where the votes are for finally addressing this important issue. So thank you for the important contributions you are making. Together, we can do what it takes to tackle global warming with hope, not fear. And I hope you have a terrific conference. I would next like to invite Professor Henry Chesbro to introduce our morning keynote. Professor Chesbro is executive director of the Center for Open Innovation at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. Previously, he was an assistant professor of business administration and the class of 1961 fellow at the Harvard Business School. He holds a PhD in business administration from University of California, Berkeley, an MBA from Stanford University, and a BA from Yale University. Please welcome Henry Chesbro. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I see a lot of people standing in the back, and I see a lot of empty seats in the front. I wonder, in the spirit of kind of clearing the market, if we might invite people from the back who really don't want to stand all morning to come sit in the front. Please, if you want to, come on down. I have the great pleasure of introducing to you uh, the morning keynote speaker, David Sandalow. Uh, there are many things that I could say about David, and over a few beers, I will. But in the interest of our time this morning, let me just make a few remarks. First, David is currently the uh, energy and environmental scholar at the Brookings Institution, where he's also a senior fellow. He's written a wonderful book this fall called Freedom from Oil, which has been a widely acclaimed book that has really addressed the issue of freedom from oil, not from a partisan standpoint, but from something that's really been supported on both sides of the aisle. Don't take my word for that. Uh, on the book itself, there's a, a quote from Richard Lugar uh, the, uh, on the Senate Republican side. And Dick Lugar says, and I quote, David Sandalow's Freedom from Oil should be required reading for all concerned citizens and elected officials. And then Al Gore, 
also said in the same book, when David Sandalo writes about energy and the environment, we should all pay close attention. So this is the kind of book that I think really inspires a conference like this because it really reaches out to a more hopeful future with policies that really make good sense for all of us. Uh, in addition to these activities, David was the chair senior advisor to Good Energies, which is a group that you may not be familiar with, but it's one of the world's leading investors in renewable energy sources. David's also the former Assistant Secretary of State and former member of the National Security Council staff under the Clinton administration. He's a happily married father of three children, and perhaps most importantly, my former debate partner at the Ann Arbor Pioneer High School debate team back in the Neolithic era. Please join me in welcoming my longtime friend, David Sandler. And I was getting about 80 or 90 miles a gallon, and I was excited. I called the company and told them this, and they said, what? That's ridiculous. We get much better than 80 or 90 miles a gallon. How come you're only doing that? And, and the, the way this car is designed, if you go up a hill or if you accelerate quickly out of stoplights, which apparently I was doing, you, you, you draw on the power and the gasoline, uh, you draw on the gasoline engine. And so they came and they showed me how to accelerate a little bit more gently out of the stoplights, ride the hills, and I was getting about 150, 180 miles uh, a gallon with this car. Um, and I also, th this, this is a demo car, and it had these big gaudy decals on it that say plug-in hybrid. And driving this car around the streets of Washington, D.C. was such a kick. I mean, people would stop me on the streets and say, can we trade? You know, it's a, they were, it was fantastic. Um, and and there, there is absolutely a, a, a great market for this car um, when, it, when it's widely available, and the good news is um, it's going to be, and, and this is really great for a Michigan kid to be able to say that General Motors is in the lead on this topic. Um, G General Motors, the company that killed the electric car, um, is uh, investing heavily in the Chevy Volt. Um, I, I, I've gotten to know over the course of the past couple of years in writing the book, Chelsea Sexton, who's really the star of that movie, Hill Who Killed the Electric Car and created, uh, crusaded against General Motors, was with her at a press conference about three months ago and heard her ask, Ms. Sexton, do you believe that General Motors is serious about their commitment on the Chevy Volt? And she said, absolutely. There's no question about it. I mean, they are, they're investing heavily in this. They're hiring battery experts and electric engineers. Um, and they, they're saying the car is going to be out on the road in 2010. Let's hope that they can make it work. Toyota is investing in this technology as well. Um, this is the technology that can make the most difference. Um, let's say one other critical f fact about it, and we could talk more about this if we have time to take some questions. Um, uh, a, a, a fundamental question when it comes to plug-ins is, so is it good for global warming? Because, of course, when you plug in a car, the energy has to come from somewhere. And in a lot of places in the United States, that somewhere is going to be a, a coal-fired power plant. So the question is, is that good from a global warming standpoint? The terrific answer is, yes, it is. And the reason is the fundamental energy efficiency of an electric motor as opposed to an internal combustion engine. Um, internal combustion engines are about 20, 21 percent thermal efficiency. Even an old-fashioned pulverized coal plant is about 30, 34 percent thermal efficiency. Um, I mean, if you think about that, the, the, it's amazing. I mean, this, these cars, these engines we've been driving around our entire life, you drive it around for more than, a, what, a couple of miles, it gets too hot to touch, right? And that's, that's all wasted energy. Um, we have radiator systems that are entirely designed to dissipate waste heat. Electric engines are much more efficient. Um, and even if you plug your car directly into a coal plant, it's, it's actually better from a global warming standpoint than driving your average U.S. car on oil. Not better than driving a Prius, by the way. Um, but the real win... Of, of this plug-in technology from a global warming standpoint is allows you to capitalize on renewable energy sources um, in the electric grid. I mean, actually, it's worth saying, I mean, you, we often hear people say, we need wind and solar power to get off of oil. And some, some people also will say, we need nuclear power to get off of oil. I mean, those statements are really only true if we, to the extent we can convert our transportation fleet to connect to the grid. There are, not many proposals out there for cars with nuclear power generators in them, you know, and, and not many proposals out there for cars with windmills on them to drive them either. You know, uh, th those technologies will generate electric power, and in order to help us get off of oil, we need to connect these cars to the grid. Um, and, uh, and, and so this, uh, these technologies have a lot of potential for doing that. I was down in Texas talking to, you, to a utility guy down there who was telling me they have fantastic wind resources um, in Texas, but they, he said his problem is they mainly blow at night. And he doesn't need electricity at night. The, the draw on you know, electric load at night is about 60% of what it is during the day. Um, and we don't have storage capacity in our electric systems, in electric grids. So 
a distributed, you know, a million plug-ins in cities around Texas would be a great way to solve that problem. People would come home, they would plug in their cars at night, they would use wind power to recharge the batteries, and they would be driving off on the wind, basically. Um, a great way of, of using renewable energy power to, in our transportation fleet. So a second conclusion is, in, order, in terms of getting off of oil, the single best technique is plugging cars into the grid. Um, third, biofuels have a role. Uh, an observation, when I started writing this book, it was quite, quite an ethanol euphoria in the country, and kind of every, everybody I talked to, Gingrich Dean, everybody was wildly in favor of ethanol. The pendulum has really swung, and I hear, as I talk about this book now, a lot more critical and skeptical questions about, about biofuels um, than, I, uh, than I do supportive questions. And I know there's a lot of work on, in Berkeley on biofuels these days, and um, you know, it's, uh, the, 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 there is increasing public skepticism about the environmental sustainability, about the impact on you know, the, the food prices, um, a lot of important work and research that, that, that needs to be done there. Um, I, uh, I mean, I talk, I, I relate in this book, um, talking to Vinod Kosala, who I'm sure many people in this, in this room know, um, and uh, I, I asked him, um, I mean, he, he's, of course, a big believer, uh, and he told me, first time I talked to him, first time I met him, he said, we're going to completely get off of gasoline in 25 years using cellulosic ethanol. And I was just getting into the topic, and I kind of figured, well, you know, Vinod's made about a billion dollars or $500 million, and has a certain amount of credibility as a result of that. Um, and I went back and I read the research, and, and I, next time I talked to him, I said, you know, that is a wildly, you know, out-of-bounds claim that we're going to get completely off of gasoline in 25 years with cellulosic ethanol. And he said, look, I've got about three $50 million bets down on different cellulosic technologies, and I know several dozen other people who have similar types of bets coming in. And I think that with that type of money coming into the field, we're going to see innovation, um, and we're going to have dramatic breakthroughs. Um, and, you know, I, I hope he's right. Um, I think it's still a pretty aggressive time frame, but I think we could see some pretty dramatic um, changes on, on, um, on, on the biofuels front. And if we do it in the area, if we do cellulosic ethanol as opposed to corn-based ethanol, it, the environmental sustainability is going to be obviously much better. Um, there's one other story about biofuels from my experience writing this book. I, I, um, I, went, uh, I went down to one of the people I interviewed for this book, in some ways one of my favorite people was Buddy Rice, his name is, he, he won the Indianapolis 500. Um, in, in uh, 2004. And the, the Indy Racing League this is being run completely on ethanol this year. Um, and, uh, you know, ethanol is a high-octane fuel. You can race cars really fast on ethanol. And I, I, had been to, I had been to auto races as a kid some. I hadn't, really hadn't gone to auto races as an adult. Um, and what I, what I remembered, um, and I, I went down to see him at the Richmond International Raceway in, in Virginia. And I, I remembered from previous trips to auto tracks two things. The, the incredibly loud sound. It's so loud you can't hear yourself talk. Um, and, uh, and the smell of gasoline. And so I went down to talk to Buddy Rice in, in Richmond, and the sound of the track was unbelievable, and it smells like a bakery. I mean, it, it, they are, they're burning sugar as they race around that track. Um, but there's, there's an amazing, you know, um, the, the politics of biofuels right now are really interesting. Um, um, uh, there is a big swing. There's a lot of concern about the sustainability of biofuels, as there should be. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, that said, the U.S. Congress just passed an enormous mandate, as many people here know, I suspect, for the use of biofuels. 36 billion gallons of biofuels to be used by the year 2022. That's a lot more than we can get out of corn-based ethanol. We're going to need dramatic innovation in order to solve, in order, in order to get up to that figure. Um, one more point about oil, and then I want to talk more about, a little bit about global warming. Um, another critical piece of, the, of, the, um, of solving the oil problem is, is mass transit and lifestyle changes. One of the things that I, I learned about writing this book was that some of the great data on telecommuting, that companies that have great telecommuting policies have happier workers and more productive workers, and there's great, great data on this, and it obviously it saves a lot of oil, too. And, and we absolutely do not have a level playing field in this country for mass transit. If you're a local government or a state government and you want money for a mass transit project, you have a much easier time, um, you have a much harder time getting it than if you want money for a road. And your reimbursement rate is lower for mass transit than for a road. We don't have a level playing field. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and and, and we, need, we need to change that. And, and, and you know, what, we, what we tend to do in a lot of places is widen roads to solve traffic problems, um, which traffic engineers know really doesn't work. If you widen a road within a couple of years, in most cases, you have a congested road that's wider with more cars on it using more petroleum. And, and somebody said that um, uh, widening a road to, to solve traffic problems is like loosening your belt to lose weight. Um, same, you know, it, it, it just doesn't work. Um, 
So a few words about global warming, because I think we are on the cusp of an incredibly important time right now <coughs> when it comes to global warming. I think, I think now is the time. And Senator Boxer already alluded to this. I mean, I've, I've been involved in energy and environment issues for a long time. I've been involved in politics all, all of my adult life, and in, indeed as a kid as well. I've never seen an issue that has grown in public profile as quickly or dramatically as the global warming issue has in the past couple of years. I mean, it, it, is, it is striking. It's, it's remarkable. Um, like so many things, it more or less started here in California. Um, and you know, California enacted um, you know, the AB 32, binding you know, cap and trade legislation for this state, um, along with a variety of other measures. Um, and it is spread around the country. Um, I, I had, a, I thought, a remarkable conversation a couple of months ago with a man named Charlie Crist, who's the governor of Florida. He, he was the success, successor to Jeb Bush in that position. Um, and it was actually, he's in the papers today, John McCain was down there with him, and Charlie Chris is being touted as a, as a good potential vice presidential nominee with, on the Republican side this year. And, and Chris told me, he said, look, I was elected in 2006, which is a Democratic year, and I'm a Republican, uh, and I'm in a 50-50 state. Florida is obviously famously a 50-50 state. I said, so how did I get elected as a Republican in a 50-50 state, you know, in a Democratic year? He said, I think the reason is my strong record and commitment on environmental protection, and global warming in particular. And Charlie Crist had been an elected uh, state attorney general, had fought hard um, on environmental issues and global warming in particular, and he said it's a bipartisan issue, that's what resonated, and I think that's why I was able to win. Um, and uh, I, up in the northeastern United States, um, we have a regional greenhouse gas program, which really started with George Pataki, Republican governor of New York, um, is they're now, in, in June of this year, they're going to auction permits um, for power plants, and they're off to launching, a, you know, an eight statewide regional greenhouse gas initiative. I mean, the momentum here um, is, is really pretty astounding. Um, what's happening in the business community is amazing. I mean, um, I, I think this may have started in some ways with, with General Electric a couple of years ago with their eco-imagination campaign, or they were kind of the cutting edge. Uh, I've heard Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, um, say, you know, for me, this, he said, my, my commitment to um, General Electric in this whole clean energy area, he said, it's not because I like to hike. He said, I'm, I'm the CEO of one of the world's largest companies. I don't have time for that anymore. He said, this is about shareholder value, and if my board didn't agree that positioning GE for clean energy was going to increase shareholder value, they would show me the door. Then he'd have time to hike. Um, but uh, General Electric, Walmart is big in this space. Um, uh, the media attention in this has been pretty astounding. I think Al Gore's movie has gotten incredible attention. It's really, it's focused people who care about this issue, who know about it generally, but who didn't really pay that much attention to it. It's focused them more on this issue. And, and finally, it's even breaking through in Washington, um, and, you know, which is kind of the last holdout um, of, of attention on this area. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, people here know, I assume, I mean, there's, there are only three people. What, the next president of the United States is gonna be one of three people. Um, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, or John McCain, all three of them are strongly in favor of action in this area. John McCain was the principal sponsor of Senate legislation on, on capping greenhouse gas emissions for the past five years. Um, the bill that Senator Box re referred to, which is now called Warner-Lieberman, used to be called McCain-Lieberman before McCain, or its predecessor essentially was, you know, was McCain-Lieberman. Um, there, you know, there, there is real progress here, and I think we are going to see in 2009 or 2010 um, binding uh, federal legislation to cap carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions out of Washington. And when that happens, I think it's going to be, uh, and I, I don't say this lightly, I think this is going to be the most significant legislation to pass Congress since Medicare in 30 years. Um, and, and I say that for two reasons. I say that because I think global warming is the single biggest crisis we face, and, and the missing, I think there are two, the two biggest problems facing the planet today are nuclear proliferation, nu potential nuclear terrorism, and, and, and climate change. They're the, they're the two existential threats. And on the climate change challenge, um, the missing piece of the answer is action out of the federal government in Washington. And without that, we cannot solve this problem. And I think we're on the cusp of solving it, uh, or we're at least on the cusp of addressing it. Um, it's also significant in another way, which is these permits that are going to be created in all likelihood. Um, the value is quite astounding. I mean, we are probably going to require permits for the emissions of about 5 billion tons of carbon dioxide in this country. Um, and uh, it's about eight, roughly 80% of what we emit. And the permit value will depend upon how much 
the stringency and other types of factors, but people are talking $20 a ton, and if you're talking 50 bil 5 billion tons times $20 a ton, that's $100 billion of permit value is going to be created by this legislation. Can you imagine the scrum on Capitol Hill around $100 billion of permits? One of the huge debates that's going to be fought over the course of the next couple of years is how those permits are going to be distributed. Are they going to be auctioned? Are they going to be given away? The answer is some combination of both. But small changes in legislation around that is going to be worth enormous amounts. The, the, um, the battle here is going to be amazing and, and, and hugely, hugely um, significant here. Um, well, uh, but although I think this is happening, and I've been saying, by the way, um, uh, I, I probably, I've probably said this a dozen times or more in the past couple of months in, in audiences, I've said, um, I think it's easily a 50-50 bet, even money, that this legislation is going to pass in 2009 or 2010. And if anybody disagrees with me, come on down afterwards and let's bet. Um, and I had, so far, no takers. So any takers in this room, I'm open to it. But I, I, think, I, think, you know, I think we will see this in 2009 or 2010. However, um, for those of you in this clean energy area and environmental advocacy area, let me just say some amount of complacency is almost setting in. I think this is going to happen, but this is a huge push, and it's not going to happen automatically. And the fact that the President of the United States is willing to sign this legislation doesn't mean that we can necessarily get 60 votes in the Senate. And, and you better believe that the forces mobilizing against enactment of this legislation are going to be huge. Um, so this is going to require a big push. It's going to be an enormous piece of the uh, agenda over the course of 2009, 2010. There's going to be a lot of other important things happening in Washington, too. Health care is going to be very centrally on the agenda. Um, obviously, what happens in Iraq is going to be very centrally on the agenda. So I think this is going to happen, but it's going to require huge pushes from everybody, um, everybody who cares about this. And, and, you know, now is the time to make that happen. And, and I think now is the time on global warming in another sense, too. Um, and I mean this in a, in a longer term sense. Um, and I, I recently heard, or I thought, a wonderful, um, wonderful speech by a man named Jim Rogers, who is a CEO of one of the large utility companies. And, and he said, he captured this point wonderfully by saying, what we need when it comes to global warming is cathedral thinking. He said, cathedrals were these vast, incredibly uh, extraordinary structures built kind of beyond the imagination of people at their time. And they took multiple generations um, to to build, and decarbonizing the world's energy supply is in many ways the challenge of our time. And it requires cathedral thinking, it requires thinking out over the course of a generation or two to figure out how we're going to get it done. But for, for the young people in this room who are just launching your careers, I mean, this is, this is the challenge of a lifetime, this, to, to work on different pieces of decarbonizing the world's energy supply, which we need to do in order to solve the global warming problem. And, you know, and, and, and Jim Rogers pointed out, he said that the, in the cathedral, you know, the, the people who built the stain, did the stained glass probably never met the bricklayers, and they might not have met the engineers, and it happened over the course of several generations, and, but everybody had their part. And for those of you who are working in biofuels, who are working in energy storage, who are working in carbon capture sequestration, who are working in photovoltaics, who are working in, you know, more efficient, you know, better materials for wind turbines, who are working in ocean energy conversion, uh, these are all critical pieces of the solution to this problem. Um, and it, it's going to require um, people sustained effort over the course of, uh, of a generation or more to get this done. And it really, I think now is the time, and it's, it's the challenge of our lifetime. So, so let, me, let me conclude with two stories. Um, and, and the first is about China, because I think you can't really talk about, about energy uh, and environmental issues without talking about China, which is, which is in so many ways the ball game. I mean, I think people here know Ch China's... I, I see figures between 50 and 100 gigawatts of installed coal capacity a year. Um, uh, extraordinary figures. Um, and and uh, I was there three months ago, and people told me that, that 600 new cars a day are being added in the streets of Beijing. Just Beijing. 600 new cars a day. Um, and that is not being matched by scrappage, right? Um, I mean, like here, where we add cars, we, we scrap about 90% of the cars that we add. But I mean, what's happening in China is absolutely central to solving this problem. And, um, I, uh, I gave a talk at, at Tsinghua University, and I took a cab. And, and I should say, for some reason, the air was absolutely clear when I was there three months ago. I, I had been in China, you know, I studied Chinese at, at a younger age and been in China a lot. I'd never been in Beijing when the air was clean. I've been in Beijing when it was, the air was so dirty you couldn't see across Tiananmen Square, literally. You know, I mean, and I, I 
couldn't imagine living there for that reason. Um, but the, the air, it was crystal clear. It, it rained heavily the day I got there. Um, and, uh, and then it was very windy, and I think those might have kept particulates out of the air. And people were speculating that maybe uh, they had turned off factories in preparation for the Olympics and were doing a test run. I, I don't know whether that's true. But I can say, you could see the mountains out. It was an amazingly crystal clear day. And I, I took a cab from Tsinghua to the airport by the Olympic uh, development, and kept the whole way, um, there are huge, new, beautiful skyscrapers going up there, and, and, and developments. It looks like kind of Orange County or Canary Wharf in London. I mean, it's first class, unbelievable, beautiful architecture. Um, and uh, I got to the airport, and I wanted to change out of business suit into travel clothes, and I wanted to check my bags before I did that, so I had to use a bathroom kind of on the outside of the airport, which I was worried would be all disgusting. And, and it was this beautiful, clean, large airport. It was like being in a private locker room. And, and incredibly efficient kind of uh, procedures all the way through the Beijing airport. And I got, I got on a 13-hour nonstop flight from Beijing to Washington Dulles Airport. And I get off the plane at Washington Dulles Airport, where there are 350 people in line and three customs agents uh, in our defunded public sector that you know we've, as a matter of national policy, stripped money away from for the past couple of decades. Um, waited 35 minutes to clear customs in Washington Dulles go to the restroom after doing that, which is small and hasn't been cleaned in, you know, 24 hours. And I thought, you know, who's the rising power here and who's the declining power? Um, what, what, what goes on in China is absolutely central to solving this whole problem, and anybody who cares about energy issues, it seems to me, should be thinking about China, spending time in China. Um, but final story, a, uh, my, my favorite trip in writing this whole book was, was actually not far from uh, my hometown. It was in the town of Reynolds, Indiana, across the border. And it's, it's a town between um, Gary and, and, uh, and Indianapolis. And the town of Reynolds, Indiana, which is a Republican part of northern Indiana, has decided that they are going to only use renewable energy. They, they, they want to get completely off of fossil fuel and only use renewable energy. And, you know, it's actually not that easy for a little town of 547 people to do that. Um, but they, they're in the middle of the Corn Belt, and they got... Um, they got... Uh, ethanol company to provide them with ethanol um, with a plant nearby. They converted the one pump in town to E85 pump. They, they got General Motors to give them some discount flex fuel cars and they bought a bunch of others and they're well on the way to having a transport sector in their little town that's almost entirely dependent on renewable energy. And, and the next step was the electric sector. Um, and uh, they're a hog town. They've got 100,000 hogs. The waste, the water quality problems there have been a big issue over years and so they uh, decided to build an electric plant that would burn this biomass, and they're well on the way to only burning biomass for their electric sector. And the, the president of town council, whose name is Charlie Van Voorst, said to me, you know, the issue here is not technology. The issue is getting people to believe in something that's never happened before. And I thought that was actually pretty wise, um, that, um, you know, we grew up with this world, our parents grew up with this world, our grandparents grew up with a world in which we're entirely dependent on oil, in which global warming, you know, is an insoluble problem. And the, the core issue is getting people to believe in something that's never happened before. Um, and so then I, I drove back to the airport to, uh, to and, and I had rented a, um, a little black GPS box, global positioning system box. Um, and it was telling me turn left in five miles, turn right in 50 feet. And I, it was the first time I'd ever rented one of these or driven with one of these before. Uh, which cost ten dollars at Hertz, and I, I told my teenage kids I was all excited, and they were kind of laughing at me actually because it was like a year ago. And my my teenage daughter said, you know, Dad, like you know, all of my friends' parents have had these in their cars for like you know the last two years, but it, it was the first time I'd ever driven with one of these. Um, and I was thinking, you know, it's it's not just that when I was their age, we didn't have little black boxes that talked to you in soothing female voices and told you to turn left in fifty feet. You know, I never had the idea of a technology like that. It never occurred to me back when Hank and I were debating in you know, Ann Arbor Pioneer High School that we would, that we would have this type of technology. And, and so I wonder, so what is it that they will say the same thing about when they're my age? That, you know, what will they look back on and say, in the year 2008, we didn't even have the idea of a technology like that? And I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, but I think that with all of the, uh, all the money, all of the energy, all of the brain power and commitment in this room, there are going to be some very exciting developments, and we will be free from oil, and we will solve the global warming problem. So thank you very much. Should I take questions, Ariel, or? Sure. Questions, comments? Sir.
Is this on? Okay. When you talk about solving the global warming problem and you look at the curve that we saw earlier today, it seems to me that at best we can do is mitigate an inevitable change. So we're pretty much focused on a strategy of mitigate where we can hedge our bets because we have a lot of unintended consequences that will probably surface as we try to apply some of these solutions. And finally, we're going to have to adapt to the reality that unfolds. So how do you see us when we've got all of these other issues also that are going to take a lot of resources? How do you see us managing our way forward through this maze? There's, this on? There's no question that adaptation to global warming is going to be essential. I mean, global, we are committed to a fair amount of global warming, as those curves suggested. Um, and even with the best success that we can hope for in terms of decarbonizing you know, the world's energy supply um, and addressing deforestation, we're going to see a lot. And so a lot of work needs to be done on figuring out exactly what type of adaptation expenditures are the highest priority. Um, and and you know, one of the key insights for anybody working on global warming is there's no magic bullet. Um, you know, somebody called it magic buckshot. Um, and a lot of people here, I presume, are familiar with the whole wedges analysis, um, which is you know, essentially 15 different technologies, or 15 different approaches for reducing um, carbon over the course of the next 50 years. The same type of, of thinking, it seems to me, applies in the adaptation area. I mean, we're, we're going, the impacts of global warming are going to be so wide ranging that we're going to need to be investing in adaptation of all kinds of, in all kinds of different ways. I mean, it's, the first, people, the first thing people think of is seawalls, and yes, seawalls are fine. We need to you know, do some seawalls in some key places. But we need to do um, uh, resilience of public health systems. We need to adjust agricultural systems. We need to figure out how to protect to, uh, biodiversity with biodiversity corridors. Um, uh, there's going to be just huge ranges of types of, of expenditures that are required for adaptation. Um, uh, it can be absolutely essential. I mean, I, I think. Um, as we do that, we also need to be investing massively in making sure that the energy technologies that we use are not making the problem worse, right? And so, I mean, the, the adaptation expenditures, expenditures cannot come at the expense of mitigation expenditures, but adaptation is going to be really important. Hey, David. Back here. Sandalo, how's it going? Uh, so one question I had for you is that uh, UC Berkeley, one of the things that we do is, is research. Uh, and uh, w one of our hypotheses is that not only do we need to accelerate the deployment of technologies that exist today, but that we need to be making long-term investments to create the breakthrough energy technologies of, of tomorrow, like you know, nanotechnology, photovoltaics, as, as cheap as paint. But as we've been learning more about these uh, nonlinear feedback levels and our sense of, uh, you know, the number that we should be trying to meet in terms of uh, atmospheric uh, CO2 concentration levels, I see more and more people saying, oh, well, we don't have any time for research. Uh, you know, we just have to take the existing technologies and, and try to dr drive them down the learning curve uh, as fast as possible. And uh, this past um, Legislative Congress uh, this past legislative session, Congress did not provide any increase in the Department of Energy Office of Science, which really does the longer term uh, uh, research in the, in the energy area. And so how do we uh, persuade policymakers that we need to do both, that we need to both uh, drive existing technologies down the learning curve and accelerate the deployment of the technologies uh, that exist today, but also uh, invest in uh, research in universities and, and national labs to create uh, energy options for uh, 10 to 20 years from now, because that, since uh, when we do get research funding, it, it goes primarily to higher graduate students, which creates the workforce of the future, is also going to create the scientific and technical workforce that we need. Thank you. Great question, Tom. Um, let, me, uh, let me answer with three parts. Um, first, let me use the occasion of, of Tom Khalil asking this question to give a quick advertisement for a project that he and I work on together, which is called the Clinton Global Initiative, which is a non-political project of the Clinton Foundation. It's a conference that has happened every year in September um, in New York, where people are, 
prominent world leaders are invited to come and make commitments about the next, about big projects that they will launch to help solve some of the world's leading problems, including global warming. Um, and I urge you to, to check it out on the web at clintonglobalinitiative.org. Next week in New Orleans, there's going to be Clinton Global Initiative U, which owes a lot to the thinking of Tom. Um, and students and universities from around the country and the world are coming together to help work on these problems. So if you're interested in this, check out clintonglobalinitiative.org. Um, Second, it occurs to me as Tom was talking um, that uh, it, it, the pretty big omission so far in this keynote session, which is that I have yet and we have yet to mention the words efficiency and conservation. Um, and that's a big omission because that's the most important beginning step in any single part of the oil problem or the global warming problem. That, that is the low-hanging fruit um, and we absolutely need to be charging forward to grab all of the opportunities when it comes to energy conservation that exist. And it's actually a critical part of the solution in China. Um, where Get this statistic. In, in China, I am told um, that the energy efficiency per unit of GDP is three times greater in, or three times worse in China than in India. Not just in an you know, industrialized country or in Japan or some energy efficient place, but then in India. So, I mean, the opportunities for energy efficiency and conservation in China are extraordinary. Um, third, to directly answer um, Tom's question, um, look, existing, you know, all the conservation measures, all the deployment of, this, of existing technologies are not going to solve the global warming problem. We need, um, uh, we, we need breakthroughs in a variety of different ways, um, and research and the type of work that you do in Berkeley is absolutely essential. And I think, um, you know, you particularly framed the question in terms of how do we convince people. Um, and I think this taps into a very strong strain of the American political psyche. I mean, um, I'm often reminded when I go abroad that Americans are much more inclined to believe that we can innovate out of problems and the technology can help solve our problems than other, uh, often than, you know, um, people from other countries. I, I, think, I think framing this in terms of the kind of historic can-do American spirit, technology, that type of thing, in this country really makes a big difference in that, um, I think, you know, in my, in my book, by the way, I call not for a Apollo project or a Manhattan project, but a Reynolds project after Reynolds, Indiana. Um, and, and I think it's, this is a, you know, a very classically American notion that we, you know, and, and I think we're going to see it over the course of the next, next few years. I think we're going to see large new increments of funding for clean energy, and it's going to be a very important part of the answer to this problem. Sir. Last question, please. You mentioned uh, going to electricity for the powering the cars, the automobiles, and one of the things is that you use a lot of coal to generate the electricity, and nuclear is the other component that we use. Do you feel that nuclear has a part in this mix? I do, um, and and um, I say this with some trepidation in Berkeley. I mean, um, but I think. Um, you know, nuclear is right now 20% of our installed electric capacity. There's, there's no solution to the global warming problem that, you know, doesn't involve some maintenance of our nuclear um, you know, electric generation fleet. Um, and, and look, I, 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 like I said, I, I think that the two single biggest problems that we face today are nuclear nonproliferation and global warming. Um, and uh, if, if civil nuclear power um, can help solve the global warming problem, without creating non-proliferation risks or other risks, I, I think that it can be part, it, it's something we need to pay attention to. Um, there are huge challenges with nuclear power right now. I mean, it, it is an expensive technology. Um, you know, get, getting Wall Street to finance it without a lot of loan guarantees, you know, governmental loan guarantees is a challenge. The waste problem is unresolved, for, and, and that's an issue. But, you know, we are also, we are using our atmosphere as a waste dump for carbon dioxide. Um, so uh, I think um, uh, for those people who care deeply about global warming, I think turning, the, closing the door on nuclear is a mistake. Um, uh, there are critical problems that need to be solved in order to scale up nuclear uh, power if we're going to do that. But um, I think it ought to be viewed with kind of an open mind about are there ways that we can that we can um, do that. I have to say, I w one of uh, um, the kind of notable experiences in um, talking about freedom from oil in the past couple of months was um, uh, 
uh, an event in Berkeley, or excuse me, in, in Boulder, uh, Colorado, um, where I was talking about this, and, and it was kind of a tighter setting than this one, and so kind of everybody was kind of crowded in, it was a pretty big crowd, and so you could really read kind of body language, and people were really enthusiastic about everything I was saying. Um, and they love the idea of plug-in hybrids. They love the idea of efficiency and everything. Somebody asked me this question. I've never seen the body language in a crowd change more quickly. It was unbelievable when I said we have to have our you know, mind open on nuclear power. Um, so, but, but I do believe it. I mean, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't we, we shouldn't rush out and build lots of new nuclear plants until some of these problems have been solved. They're critical issues. But I, I think closing the door on nuclear is, would, would be a big mistake. Um, it is just a great honor for me to be here, and, and uh, this is going to be a great day ahead of you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much.